So, um, most of you know me, but those who don't know me, I, I work for the SSC North Alliance, um, and I'm sort of like leading their innovation team. So, if you think Neil Johnson, my Alliance Director, is M, um, my depots, as our double O branches, so our principal engineers, are licensed to kill, I'm Q. Clearly, that leaves Rob Blackstock as Money Penny. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. I had to get you in somewhere, didn't I? So, that's, that's a little bit about me. So, um, a bit of an introduction. So I'm here talking about, we've got Ian, people like Sinsin, designing, manufacturing, precision, s &C. Then there comes to us, so some heavy-handed, fisted idiots who have to put it in the ground. So I'm trying to put a bit of science and a bit of um, engineering into getting it in right first time as we install it. Get it right first time, it'll do what everybody wants it to do. If we don't get it in right first time, it'll fail. It's a simple fact as that. So uh, the SC North Alliance, we've been pretty successful at this, and um, since the Alliance has formed, we've taken the normal handback speed of 50 miles an hour, and we now, as a norm, if we can, hand back at 95 miles an hour. If we've got the right kit, the right tools, the right access, and everything else, we can actually do line speed. So um, Belford Sandy, 125 miles an hour, High Dyke, 150, only because it's a permanent speed restriction there, and we could have done more, apart from we've had a few little restrictions placed on us, but that's fine, because as Ian said, we have to pilot things, we have to understand things before we go rushing forward. Um, but we've basically progressively increased our handback speeds and now we are very, very confident at handing back at 95 miles an hour if the line speed allows it. And um, we look at, we look at, well, we don't even consider not handing back at line speed unless we have to. Uh, and so how have we done that? How have we gone about doing that? So there's sort of, I thought about this and there's probably three things really. There's progressive assurance, get it right first time, which is the bulk of my presentation. Um, but more importantly, um, this collaboration with others, we can't do it all by ourselves. And also, <coughs> the bit where I come in, key branch innovation. Um, so, progressive assurance. Uh, what, what is it? So, rather than just traditionally what we used to do is throw the track in, um, make, make a tamper as built and hope the tamper will fix it, fix it all and fix all our sins, we actually take care at each stage of the construction process that we get it right first time. Um, so we actually build quality in as we go, rather than trying to leave it right to the end to do it. So at each phase of the renewal process, we have a look at that, and we decide what it is we want to achieve, and once we decide what it is we want to achieve, we decide how we're going to measure it, and come up with a tolerance. And the tolerance of 30 miles an hour is going to be no difference to the tolerance of 125 miles an hour. And we set ourselves a series of tolerances. So we construct the track, we measure it, and then we make a choice. Is the measurement fit for the line speed we want to hand back at? If it is, great, we go to the next phase of strap construction. If it's not, it's no go. So we have a couple of choices then. We either go back and make it fit, if time allows, or if time's against us, or other factors are against us, such as fan soft formation. We look at the tolerances. Okay, it's no longer fit for 125. We can hand back safely at 60, and then we go forward. Armed with that knowledge, we can progress forward safely. And that's basically progressive assurance. And throughout the process, for each of the things, we bring in technology, different units and measures to make that all happen. So some, some of the technologies, I'm not going to go into them all, is basically um, absolute coordinates, machine control, 3D control, GPS, you name it. By bringing all this sort of stuff into play, we can get far, far more accurate insulation and tolerances. So for example, the 3D dozing compared to a laser dozer, rather than having to keep changing our instruments every time we have a, a gradient or step change, we can simply design a dozer file for the 3D dozer, plug it into GPS or into total station, and the dozer planes will actually follow the design absolutely perfectly. Actually, it makes life easier for our techs, but also gives us better quality. That said, the technology just fall over, so we do absolutely, we still peg all our sites out, we still write on the six foot, um, so we can go back to traditional methods, if necessary, if the technology fails us. And quite regularly, the technology does fail us for one reason or another. Generally, an engineer and trained partner in front of the instrument because we haven't got enough control on the ground. But again, that's another lesson to learn. We need to put more control on the ground. Um, other things we do there, um, we, we try to eliminate the waste and defects as, as we go along. We don't want to overdig uh, because basically we haven't got enough stone in our engineering trained, or we haven't got enough engineering training capacity to take the stone out, so that's a bit of a no-no. Or we end up doing a nice 300 mil dig too wide, and we end up then having to go, oh, I best go down to 200 mil, and uh, not meet the specification, which is not good. But equally, if we underdig, um, the track bed team and all the people who've done that hard work of design 
we're not going to get it right. So we take a great deal of care in getting all those tolerances right. Um, one of the, one of obviously, one of the things we really focus on is the ballast insulation and the compaction. When we put the stone in the ground, we want to know that it's able to take the force of the train passing at the speed. Um, and to be honest, we struggle a little bit in this area. We can bring in the, um, the big bow mag roller, that's absolutely brilliant, and that will give us a nice little trace assuring us exactly how that track's performed. It's great. But the trouble with the bow mag roller, it's a big beast, and if you've got space and time to use it, great. But when you're in a, a confined space and a confined time, getting this big beast into the ground causes the guys in the, um, the deck some problems. So we need to look at some more solutions to that. But as it stands, when we go above 95 miles an hour, we need that added assurance. So that trace from the bow mag is key because we can exactly see how that track's going to perform. Um, we are confident with triple whackers at the moment to go to 95 because we've done some tests, we've done some levelling tests, we've done some falling weight deflectometers tests, and we, and we, it, we know that six past of the triple whackers that ballast can, doesn't compact consolidate anymore. But what we rock hard really honestly tell you, hands and heart, is what is there. We just know that's probably as good as it gets and it's a bit of a grey area we're working on. Uh, and the other thing is, um, is closing the rail. Obviously, a clamp joint is not right first time and we've got uh, the standard even says we can't hand back at more than 50 or we've got some of the temporary joints back old drilling, the high speed clamping system which goes further. But actually, right first time is actually getting that weld done there and then on the spot in the possession. That not only gives us better assurance, but it also gives us better track quality because we're not getting that joint memory in the ground. So on the Alliance, we pride ourselves in literally uh, every core possession. At the back end, we squeeze in the welding. And it is a squeeze, but we get it done. The only time we do might compromise on that, if time is against us, the welding is curtailable, we could joint it, but we'll have to back at 50. Or, at the very worst, we leave the um, turnout route jointed, but the through routes are, through routes are welded. Uh, and then finally, bringing all that together, the progressive assurance is absolutely fine, but you need to make people responsible for their job. So the, the tech in charge of the dig, or the supervisor, whoever it needs to be, needs to own that part of the job. We can't just leave it all to the speed raiser at the end. The speed raiser is not there for the full 36 hours, 52 hours, whatever it is. So before we start, we look at all the different jobs at the whiteboard meeting and we say, okay, or preferably before the whiteboard meeting, who is the tech responsible for that element of the work? So as you can see, there's a list of names there. We also have a deputy in case somebody gets sick. That person's a responsible person. He's the guy on site measuring his work or measuring another person's work to make sure it's right first time. At the end of his task, in this case, he signs a piece of paper. That signature is quite powerful because he's actually putting his name to that job. So when the speed raiser turns up on the last shift, he's then presenting with a pack of information over and above what's required for the Form G, which he can go through, have a look at, and he can be confident that every element of that renewal has been booked right first time. And it also gives us a rather nice engineering record of how we constructed that track. So I'm just going to show you a quick video of what happens when you bring it all together. Um, you'll see when the uh, towards the end of the video, you'll see it. Sorry, I'll, I should shift. I can't let the test come, mate. Sorry. Um, you'll see the results of um, what you, what happens when you get it right first time. But hopefully, there's some sound to this, and I don't need to keep going. There should be some sound. Is there the um, technician that should be some sound in this? So in the background you can see all the progressive assurance paperwork which our guys assigned, um, making sure that everything's there and then done and dusted. As you can see, it's well thumbed, well used, so it's not just done for the camera, it's actually physically used. It's a bit scary taking this video, I have to be honest. <laughs>
So it's not, as you can see, to get track and sword right, it's not just one, one, there's no silver bullet. Everything has to be absolutely perfect. Everything has to be spot on. Getting the turnout route, getting the third on, get that consolidation of the turnout route. Everything is considered. Void mates for remote monitoring the track as we walk away. I am Mark Smith, principal engineer for SSC North Lions in Doncaster. Just here at Idai. It's going to be a few mile an hour light speed up back. A lot of what we've done here this weekend is it's nothing new, it's just formalising all the good practice we've been doing over the years. So it's a um, Nice to see all the good practice pulled into one place and, and um, implemented. Hello, my name is Pat Walker. I'm Senior Supervisor uh, for the SNC Northern Alliance. Um, we're here at uh, Idyke, we're just about to hand back at 115 mile an hour. It gives me a, a great sense of achievement to do this. Um, the SNC Alliance have got a fantastic delivery record and I'm proud to be part of the team. So, you watch the bottom of the corner. This is Pretty much how solid the track is. First train up. Speak to it, sir. So, Mark, how does it make you feel professionally to hand back at such high speeds? Well, it's a, it's a sense of pride, isn't it? You know, to keep pushing the boundaries and you know, trying to do the best job that you can do. Uh, that, that turnout at High Dyke. Um, the first NMT went over it, we achieved 100% track quality to T102. Simple as that. Um, there's a few spelling mistakes in there which I apologise. You've probably taken that. It's all about quality. Even the pros get involved out of here, Steve. Always room for improvement. So as I said, so progressive assurance right first time is one of the tools we use to be able to get the track <coughs> installed to a high quality. But it, it, it's so much more than that. So it's collaboration. So the uh, alliance, and um, both alliances do the same. Our design teams, our production teams, our engineering teams, myself, our management, we work together. We come together as one. We're in the same offices, so we can have constructability reviews, we can understand this design is going to work and stuff like that. It's very, very important. If our S&T guys aren't talking to our LE guys, aren't talking to our P-Way guys, we don't stand a chance of doing this. So we make sure we're all talking to each other and we use a very much a system engineering approach to do it. <coughs> um, we, we, get, we go outside for help. So um, I know Pablo's not here, but I'm not sure if any in, in the central innovation team are here today. But some of the things are just a little bit too big for us to carry out ourselves. So the um, use of DTS and SNC, that was done very much in collaboration with STE and the Central Innovation Team and also um, SP Rail to be frankly honest because it's their machine. Um, but that allowed us to understand all the risks around dynamic track stabilisation and SNC and that culminated in us actually doing the world's first which is actually parallel the DTS in your SNC which has never been done in the entire world before and that's um, that's straight from the manufacturer of the DTS to confirm that, so that's a, quite an achievement. But also the supply chain. We have plant supplies, we have tamper supplies, we have labour supplies. We have loads of suppliers. So what do we do? We don't just get them to rock up on the day of the race. That's no good. So people like the tampers, the classic example, when we're planning these high-speed handbacks, when we're planning that, we invite them to our whiteboard meetings. We invite them to planning meetings. We get to understand their machines. We get to understand what exactly they need presented in front of them to get the optimum out of these machines. Just little things like this make a big, big difference. So simply, when the tamper rocks up on site, we go and greet the tamper operator. We invite him to have a walk for the site. Make sure he's got a nice warm cup of tea. All these little things help. And it sounds silly, but it all helps. Um, so that's collaboration. So we also have to bring some innovation in the mix to make these things work. So as I already said, uh, dynamic track stabilization. Um, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, especially in the area of the ramps, because the big BOMAD roller next to it can't treat the ramps. But with, with progressive assurance, it's like a bit like a Swiss cheese model, we always make sure we have more than one layer of assurance. The more layers we can have, the more assured we can be. So the dynamic track stabiliser, treats probably the top 100mm of ballast, 
and the shoulders, gets all that laterally constrained, but it also treats the ramps. We've got the bone mag roller. The bone mag roller, the beauty of that, it gives us lovely uniform consolidation throughout the whole, whole track system, but more importantly, it tells us exactly what it's done. We can see what it's done. And then when we walk away, we're handing that track back over. Sometimes we're in red zones. How do we ensure that track is performing on the traffic? Well, we got the, we're now using remote void meters, which data and supply, and um, it will give us remote void meeting to our, to our mobile phones. We can exactly see how that track's performing. Generally, this track performs absolutely well. Um, the high dike video, one millimetre avoiding we had until we went into the follow-up tank. But if that track does start going off, we get warnings, we can safely plan interactions to maintain the speed. What last thing we want to be doing is uh, rushing and putting the ESR in. So, um, as I say, Q branch. So we never rest. So the first on the menu is a... Um, Nick Malford here from Mirage, did Nick make it in the end? Clearly not. So um, we're, we're, de we're developing induction welding, which is basically solid phase welding, flash, if you will, for S and C. So we can actually, rather use thermic welding, we can use a solid phase welding. Um, the head is currently being built and hopefully it will live in June. I say hopefully, it will be. We'll be launching induction welding at rail live in June, so you'll be able to see that live for yourself. Um, intelligent triple whackers. We spoke about the bone mag being great, but it's difficult to get in. If we can get the same level of assurance out of a triple whacker we get out of the bone mag, my, my delivery teams will be extremely happy with me. So I'm working with a company called Datum and also Torrent, who actually owns about 92 triple whackers, so they do have a slight vested interest in getting this stuff going. They actually develop a bolt-on accelerometer, for want of a better phrase, which will tell us the stiffness in the ballast. So that's being worked on at the moment. Uh, and the one at the end, RRV rail crane. Um, at one point, the technology didn't exist to have an RRV, a road rail vehicle, which could lift a, well, the challenge I set to the marketplace was to lift a modular switch, F-panel switch, which is about 30 tonnes when you get the uh, modular beam on. We normally have to bring in the big boy, the Kirovs in. We can get a road rail crane which can do that. Not only can we save ourselves a lot of money, give ourselves a lot more flexibility, but we've also got a machine we can use for many, many other aspects and sites. We have a design. Uh, and we do potentially have, I can't tell you who, a customer. So that's coming up soon. So finally, to close up, um, the benefits and outcome. Um, safety, if we get it right first time, we don't have to keep going back. That reduces the amount of times where our workforce is exposed, simple as that. Uh, our passengers, basically, they have less disruption to their timetable, and that's got to be ultimate king. Um, for network rail, there's massive Schedule 8 savings because we're not paying punitive, um, punitive penalties for lowering the speed. And also, we can start thinking about reducing access. We don't have to go back in so many follow-ups. Less so Schedule 4. The reliability, the track quality, passenger comfort speaks for itself. I think the video showed that. Um, we reduce the amount of follow-up tamping shifts. We got it right first time. We don't need a whole series of follow-up tamps. We maybe can bring that down to one or two. In fact, Derby, if, with the line speeds at Derby and the Derby project, if we can use DTS, we'll save ourselves around about £2.2 .2 million pounds in tamper ships just at Derby, if we get that right, because it's absolutely huge. Uh, and again, if we reduce environmental impact, we're, we're, we're just not um, burning so much diesel and stuff like that. So finally, um, just to have a quick read of that, that's what our customers think of um, right first time with high speed handbag. Uh, as you can see, it means a lot to these guys, and they are our customers. And um, I've got any questions up, but I'll wait till the end. So um, thanks very much, and hopefully Steve, I was uh, okay. brief enough for you.